Hey everybody, welcome to the Atheist Experience Live. It's May 24th, 2015. I'm Matt Dillahoney. Joining me, Tracy Harris. Howdy. Welcome back from your California excursion. <laughs> it was fun. Everybody was great there. It was a good time. How many, how many talks did you give? I think I gave three talks and then did a couple dinners and it was, it was real. Oh, and the booth in uh, sure. Balboa Park. That was really something. Yeah, that was did, super. Uh, when I was there, I got to meet the mayor right before his big scandal. So that was kind of funny. Wow. Uh, but uh, yeah, so welcome to the Atheist Experience. It's a live public access television show where we uh, take calls and talk about, well, pretty much whatever the callers want to talk about. But it's, you know, religion, philosophy. Tell us what you believe, why you believe it, to ask us questions about being an atheist or the experience of being an atheist, I guess is how the whole name thing got started. I don't know. I don't have any big announcements to make other than uh, this coming weekend I'll be in Lexington, Kentucky for the Kentucky Freethought Festival. And also there won't be a show next week because it's Fifth Sunday. Um, so it'll be two weeks before our next show. And when we're done with this episode, everybody involved or most of the people involved get together and go to dinner at uh, El Arroyo and they'll have the address right up there on the screen any second now. Uh, it's a live call-in show, but all the lines are already full, um, so hang tight. What, Tracy's going to talk to us a, about a topic for a few minutes, yeah. and then we'll get through calls, and hopefully we'll get some more. Yeah, just really quickly, um, I just ran across a discussion on a thread where people were talking about something that is sort of um, an innately uh, human attribute, mm -hmm. and some people were, you know, didn't like it, and were saying that, oh, we should, you know, we should maybe curb this, uh, and... Other people were saying, you know, that's, but it's, it's innate. It's, an, it's part of human nature. It's dehumanizing to ask people to curb their humanity. And uh, one person came out and said, well, but we, but how is that different than saying that we should curb, you know, other things like murder, rape, you know, things like that, uh, stealing. And I thought, isn't it interesting that somebody would associate an innate uh, normal human psychological state with these abnormal psychological states? that would be extremely destructive if they were expressed in social species as a norm. You know, and it, so it was really odd to me. And I, and I thought about the implication of that, that this person was equating normal human psychology with abnormal human psychology, uh, you know, one being non-detrimental, one being detrimental to human social structures. And I realized, oh, wow, this is like a sec uh, secular absorption of the Christian doctrine that people would just rape and murder and do all these horrible things if we didn't have yeah. these blocks on it. We have a depraved, sinful nature. Yeah. One of the yeah. things, though, is that from, from a scientific perspective, from what we know about reality, it's possible that um, what would be considered, not normal perhaps, but typical um, traits of humans may well have changed over a million years or so, you know, the types of attitudes we had, but that's about us learning about what's better for us. Um, so I like the fact that there's a, you know, this, it, 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 may, it may have been that there were a whole bunch of people who were what we would call abnormal at some point. Right, but I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even have a successful social species. I mean, ne not even just um, talking about human beings, but any social species. If there was this innate, constant drive to murder everybody, <laughs> and yeah, to I murder all your, your social peers. Um, the, but I the, think there's two things here. It's not just that they're necessarily absorbing Christian ideas, but also there's this idea of the lizard brain, the very, very far past of us that we're, we have to keep fighting against. And I just don't see the fight. I mean... Well, that's the thing. I, I had to think to myself, and I wondered, like, is the person that's posting this sitting around all day saying, oh, my gosh, I can't murder, I can't murder, I can't murder, because I don't have that problem. So I don't know, like, if, if they really have these inclinations all the time to rape and murder and they feel like they are, um, what they described it was, like, um, adapting that in order to, you know, I ensure the social contract. And I'm like, I don't feel like I have to stop myself raping and murdering <laughs> yeah. uh, all the time. And part of being a social species is that we've developed things like a sense of fairness, empathy, equity. I mean, we have evolved these things, and that's demonstrable. You can, you can see species that, have, that we have bred to be more social, and they start to pick up on these traits. They're more communicative. They're more um, desirous of interaction with members of their own species. And so you have this intraspecies uh, empathy, equity, sense of fairness that occurs that we call morality. And with that... Um, you really shouldn't innately be, I mean, I'm not going to say that there won't be the odd, you know, psychopath in your midst, yeah. 
but that's by no means something that we should be considering that all people have to adapt to the, to the it's like, no, that's an abnormal psychological state for it, a human being. It reminds me of a comment that uh, Penn Jillette made once, which is, you know, he murders just exactly as much as he wants to, which happens <laughs> to be zero. Right. Uh, but when you're talking about them obsessing on it, that reminded me that uh, my friend and brilliant comedian Keith Lowell Jensen has an entire bit about a guy who got a, a tattoo yeah. about, you know, uh, if a man lies with another man as he lies with a woman, it's an abomination and they're deserving of death, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know, was he sitting around? It, basically, he needed something on his arm to remind him not to have sex with guys. Yeah, um, I don't know. And, and then, there, of course, there's the verse about tattoos. So, uh, <laughs> Which it, is it, on it, his other arm, I'm sure. But I'm not going to do Keith's whole bit because he's right. way better at it than I am. Yeah, they but. asked me if I had a topic, and that would be my topic. It's just, uh, you know, beware that you're not picking up on, I guess, you know, theistic social claims that really aren't valid. Um, don't just adapt a social attitude that may be religious uh, at its foundation or in, you know, in how it has inculcated the culture. So beware of these, you know, these norms that we believe or take as givens that may not actually be a given and may not be um, defensible. They might just be something that we have come to accept um, just like the uh, the purity cults, you know, we, yep. so many people that are secular even have this attitude that that um, you know you don't want don't want people that are you know young people to have sex, don't want you know, and they have all this this weird fear around sexuality and the idea of purity and don't sleep with too many people, and so it's just like this this purity cult that has um, pervaded the culture in a weird way because of the religious history. Um, but it really, uh, you really shouldn't take that to be like a human norm as much as a cultural norm. Not only that, but it, it kind of, it, there's a number of things that are just kind of wrong, like the good old days mentality. Um, yeah. But it gets, it, they use those things in order to bolster other claims which are false. Like, you know, oh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Everything's yeah. just getting worse. Yeah. And it's what not. they really mean is that um, their particular religious ideas about sex and other stuff aren't being followed by as many people. Yeah. When in reality, the world is, is better than it's ever been yeah. by virtually any uh, measurable yeah. characteristic. Yeah. Slavery so, still exists, but at least it's not legal. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like at least we've not. learned enough that you know, this shouldn't be endorsed by the state. And then you've got, you know, I, I'd recommend <laughs> you know, like Stephen Pinker's book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which... Yeah kind of debunks this idea that the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, I and, find it interesting it. because I'm, I'm old enough to remember those better days that people claim. So I remember what that was like, and they weren't better. It was a time when if you were like a single parent, if you were divorced, that, that was like a curse. You couldn't be divorced. You, you know, couldn't be a single parent. If you got pregnant, they had to whisk you away somewhere where, they, where you would go visit your aunt for several months and then come back and everything was fine and you never had a baby and we just keep our mouths shut and lie about it. Or we put a shotgun to you and force you to get married when you're 17, 18 years old, which happened all the time. So you have these, and then you're not allowed to divorce. So you have these people that were too young, forced into marriages, they had no options. And then they end up staying married for these long lengths of time where people congratulate them based on quantity of years instead of quality of the marriage. Many yeah. of these people were not in happy marriages. It was a horrendous freaking plan. But you didn't have, I mean, it's like you, they're looking at it like saying you didn't have divorce, you didn't have, there were no gay people to either. Oh, right? yeah. No gay people. Gay right? people just didn't exist. Yeah, there weren't any. And so tell the, tell the, I, think, <laughs> I think there were some, some scare tactic propaganda movies in the 50s, yeah. and that's when gay people first appeared yeah. in, in culture. It, it was just like, they, it, it was all based on a culture of lies. So all, if, and I always recommend to people that you go and research and like watch the film Peyton Place. Like seriously watch that movie if you really want to get an, an eyeful of what the, the glorious past was actually like. It was just everybody keep your mouth shut. Nobody knows what's going on. If he's in there with his daughter at night, nobody needs to know. It's their business. It's their family. I mean, it was horrendous. And nobody talked about it. So now later, they can come forward and say, see how much better it was? Like nobody ever complained. And it's like, yeah, because you didn't open your mouth. Nobody opened their mouth and there was all this horrible stuff going on and all these horrible p things that people were being forced into and kept in that nobody really enjoyed and we just, you know, everybody was suffering in this quiet desperation and that was this wonderful past. 
Now it's more open, and so maybe you do, you know, first of all, being more open is good in many ways, but some things that we're open about, we're seeing a lot more, like you'll see a lot more about, like, um, you know, families where uh, molestation is occurring, and it seems scary because it's like, you, you know, this is a horrible thing to hear about, but is it better that nobody talks about it and we deny it's going on and we never address it? I mean, that's what it was like when I was a kid. Nobody said anything, nobody did anything, you just kept your mouth shut, and that was how it rolled. That wasn't better. Hearing about it more is not necessarily an indicator that it's worse. Yeah, there were more people, more categories of people who were in positions where they were effectively powerless. And we are moving, we're not there yet, but we are moving towards an era where more and more of these categories are becoming empowered thanks to the internet, thanks to work for uh, civil rights, human rights, you know. And if you're gay, you can get married in Ireland now. Yeah, yeah. woohoo! And half of the states in the United States, and pretty much uh, oh everywhere, gosh. hopefully soon. But I posted some funny quotes, like the, from church leaders there, when they were saying they are saying things like, "We don't know how to get our message, like our our message about family, you know, to the to the members clearly." And I'm like, "No, I think they got the message. I think they just rejected it." Yeah. We don't know how to get them to accept our <laughs> terrible message. Our bigotry isn't um, sticking, and we don't know why. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when it, when in the past, when people had a really terrible message that it was difficult to get people to accept, it was always done by force, and thankfully the church is no longer in the position where it can exercise quite as much force as it used to. Ah, oh, but those were the good old days. The good old, good old days. days of the Inquisition. Uh, the only way I look back uh, <laughs> in, into the past and say those were the good old days um, is like if I'm feeling a little ill like I am today and I felt better two <laughs> days ago, that was the good old day. You well, know? there might have been some good old days when I looked a little better yeah, and you know, a bit well, younger, you know. But little lighter, a yeah. little yeah, yeah. less gray. There you go. But, yeah. but in those days, when I was lighter and less gray, I didn't have the internet and Chromecast yeah, and yeah. you know access you to go. to tons of debates and documentaries and you know I'm books making the best readily of it. I'm going for superhero streaks. That would be I, awesome. I, I'm doing it too. You can see it's like coming in there, like freaking on both sides. So we'll, we'll be changing the requirements for the show. Uh, once upon a time, you had to be bald and goateed if you were a male uh, or presenting as, as a man. <laughs> and now I, I think we're just going to say that the requirement's gray for all. There you go. So if you come on the show and you're not gray, we're going to make you like wear a silly hat or something. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, let's uh, let's move on to callers. Go. We've got William in Henderson, Nevada. How you doing? Hey, William. Hey guys, I'm great. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. you sound great. Awesome. Um, I am wearing a silly hat because I'm not great out. But okay. um, my, my my question was primarily: Do you think in uh, faith inhibits society? Oh, society. Oh, okay. That's a little bit uh, different than the question we were expecting, but um, can you give me a little bit, like, what do you, what do you consider faith? What do you, how do you define faith? Uh, religion, uh, such as Christianity, let's say that is a specific example. Do you think Christianity inhibits society? I think that it can. I mean, that's as fair an answer as I can give. I was reading recently, in fact, um, some history around 1832, and I know that's a little bit older than today, but it had to do with um, the Cherokee Nation and the Trail of Tears. And one of the things I noticed was that there were a handful of missionaries who actually advocated for the Indians and did what they could to get their cases brought to court and help them out. Some of those missionaries were working with them um, in the context of being in, on, the, on their land, because it wasn't a reservation at the time, it was their land, um, and they were translating Bibles with them. So they were there in the capacity of working for the church, but their capacity of being there allowed them to empathize with the Indians that they were with and to, and to help them out with bringing their cases to court and going through to SCOTUS to get them the right to their land, which ultimately did them no good. But at least they did get, go through court and they were advocated by these ministers or by these missionaries. I feel, though, that people can empathize and help and advocate even without religion. In, th in this specific case, though, I understand that it was their religious beliefs that actually had them uh, involved in those, uh, relig those uh, Native American communities. Um, so I think there are some cases where uh, religion has been useful, like there were people when we had the Underground Railroad that advocated helping with that. 
uh, because they felt like it was their religious duty. But at the same time, you had people that were advocating slavery because they felt that was their religious right, and they felt like that was the way that God had set it up. Um, I think sometimes a church can serve as a hub for people who really just want to do good things. And what I would really love would be to one day see these hubs primarily be focused on just good and not necessarily be promoting things that may not be uh, well substantiated from, a, from an evidence point of view to where you don't have to believe in something that is not well supported in order to do social good. I would prefer to see that, uh, but I, I, I would say that um, if you're talking about Christians, there are certainly Christian churches and Christian groups that do a lot of social good, uh, but I think that the supernatural beliefs may be ultimately detrimental and telling people to believe things for, uh, before they're actually evidenced may not be the best mode of helping people think in a, in a, a the, the best way, I suppose, or the way that would help them best negotiate reality in other areas of their life. Does that make sense? It, it does. It sounds like you're saying it's an in, it is an inhibitor to their worldview. So, yeah. So I, there's a quote from Weinberg that is, uh, without religion, good people will do good things and bad people do bad things. Um, but it takes something like religion to get good people to do bad things. Uh, th there's a handful of problems with that quote. But when I look at it, when I see... Um, Religious organizations have done good things all over the place uh, throughout our history, but none of those things required religion or required the truth of the propositions that that religion make, uh, makes or made. Um, so creation of universities and you know feeding the homeless and the poor and stuff like that, uh, these things are, churches have done them and they're good, no denying it. Uh, but would those same people who participated in those, who are the ones who should really get the credit. They're the ones donating their time, uh, whether they think they're doing it because, if they're only doing it because they think their religion told them to, are they really that good? I mean, if they're doing it because they actually care about people, isn't that better than I'm doing this because if, you know, it's, it's the way I demonstrate that I'm a decent person so that I can get into heaven or avoid hell and things like that. Well, yeah, and just to point well, out, well, I, well, just to let you know, I, it's probably, it may not be this way everywhere, but I know that here in Texas, we'll get letters to the editor sometimes where conservative religious people will write in to say they don't want tax dollars going to um, welfare, to charitable, you know, welfare um, needs. And their argument is that it's not really charity if they're forced to donate. So they literally stand in the way of, of social welfare for people that are in need because they feel like they want their church to own it. And so they don't want society to take that on and to start taking care of it. I know that this is you know, not every religious person. I'm saying this is, this is what, how I've seen many highly conservative people reason. And I feel like that's a detriment for sure. Right. I, I would blame that more on their po policies than uh, religion, though. Well, I but mean, they're, they're re like they, they are happy to donate. They just want to make that donate a choice, donation a choice. But the problem is people's ability to survive shouldn't be based on a choice that their society makes. It, it needs to No, I, I agree with you 100%. And I think it's a scapegoat. I think they're lying. I think they're just saying they want to donate. But then, you know, once they're not forced to, they wouldn't. But uh, I have a question uh, for Matt, if I may, just to, sorry to derail from the topic. Uh, yeah, let me, let me finish up with this topic real quickly, though, by saying uh, my, big, my take on this is that um, we don't need anything at all like religion in order to motivate people to do good things. Um, and for a while, I used to you know, offer up like a steak dinner to, to anybody who could demonstrate something real and true and substantive that can only come from a religion, in fact, being true. Uh, because you can motivate people with lies, and you can motivate people with empathy and compassion. And so the asp the, uh, when we talk about does religion inhibit society uh, or work towards its benefit, well, it's a mix of both. But on the whole, um, I would say that some of the ways that it's inhibited society are I incredibly uh, impactful uh, in, in a negative way to retard progress in certain areas, especially when it comes to social justice issues or destroying the library at Alexandria, or you know, pick, your, pick your poison there, yeah. uh, what, you know, what the Catholic Church has done in a number of different areas. 
Um, and so... Yeah, destroying families, ripping away rights. There's a lot of harm. Right. And so right. I've always said, you I, know, I would agree take, with you both there the good when it comes to extremely organized religion. But uh, I, I don't think that's religion as, a, as an entirety. As right, but when I it. asked for a definition of faith, you, to be fair, you did say Christianity. But no, no, I was very broad. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so the whole thing is take the good wherever you find it and get rid of the bad. And so f to the extent that religions encourage some good things, I don't think we need the religions in order to encourage that, so get rid of them. But anyway, you, you had a, a okay. second question. Right, right. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, w would you ever debate G-Man? Oh, I have no interest in actually debating him. Uh, in Well, it depends on what you mean. So, you know, this is, well, the show isn't what I do for my job, but doing debates uh, is. And the problem is, uh, I've tried to actually engage in conversations with him. Um, I don't like to just say negative things about, let's say, let's just say that he's not the most reasonable person on the planet, and I find it to be a waste of time, and I'm baffled why anybody pays attention to him anymore. And so right. while, while, I'm, while I'm setting up debates with, or trying to set up debates with William Lane Craig and Frank Turek and other, you know, these are people who have a, a history of getting up in front of a podium and presenting a case and being uh, respectful and professional. Uh, and th I'm not, this isn't just with regard to G-Man. There's a ton of people on YouTube uh, who don't have that at all. Uh, and I will, I'll be happy to go on podcasts and have conversations with people. But if, you were, if you're talking about like a formal public debate, I don't know if anybody buy a ticket. So. Well, well, I'm just talking about a YouTube debate. And I, I think it would be very popular between the two of you. I mean, why, why, would you think, popular, why would you think it would be very popular? Because I posted a video response to him that was like 35 minutes of pretty much me reading and explaining the Bible. And all he had to do was watch that video and post his actual responses. I gave him the opening to, to have a productive conversation. And instead what he does is, uh, you know, rants and calls me a coward and puts on like boxing headgear and I'm going to own Zor, the atheist. I mean, he's, he's a buffoon. And I have better things to do with my time than try to debate with pigeons who are going to, you know, knock the pieces off the board and poop all over it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, I would just encourage uh, you to do it. Uh, I mean, you can always back out if it does become well, I, disrespectful. I don't need to, I don't, you know, so I don't, okay, so you're encouraging me to do it. Do you know how many people have said, please don't ever engage with this buffoon again? Um, because it's ridiculous. I mean, so like, let's say somebody from the Flat Earth Society um, or the Inflated Earth uh, model decides that they want to debate, you know, uh, some moderately prominent physicist or geologist on the the history of the earth should that happen should we waste time absolutely I, I mean wasting time is subjective i mean if you have free time and you're getting paid to do it it's not really a waste of time and it's uh, well, it, it's just going to be a it's just going to be a pub stomp right why would you want that so so here's the thing if we're about having good discourse and we're about having good conversations and making people think what good does it do to have like, if you, if you want to be known, if you want to, to have people view you as, like, a good basketball player, do you go down to the kindergarten and start swatting them out of the way as you go up and dog stomp the basket over and over again? <laughs> I mean, does it, the people who find that sort of thing entertaining, I think they make me sick. I mean, that's, that's the level that we're kind of talking about. Thanks for calling me sick real quick, but uh, I just enjoyed so you would, the... You would, want to, you, would mean, want to, you would actually want to see an NBA player swat kindergartners around on a court? No, but I would then compare I that to the flat, flat Earth Society there. Uh, what, what I would liken it to is the Flat Earth Society does have some coherent arguments no, they that don't. can be easily refuted by a young child. Right? Okay, okay, so if they have arguments that can be easily refuted by a young child, let them debate young children. And if they get past the young children, then they can come after those of us who actually know something. <laughs> <laughs> so go find, right. go find some young children for G-Man to debate. <laughs> Anyway, well, that, that was a little far, but thank you very right. much for having me on. Thank you, I, I gave him every opportunity, but and, and I'm sure he's going to get another one because uh, my understanding is that he might be on one of these. Other well, that was a very happy streaming. call, and I just want to yeah. note that they, they identified William as theist. So just FYI, that was a theist caller. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, because it wasn't really obvious. 
from the call, I don't think. It's all good. No, I'm just saying, people are always like, you should have theists on. Well, he was a Yeah, theist. it was listed, at least listed as a theist. Or he identified as we, such. We will assume it was correct. Yeah. Uh, Patrick in Germany, thanks for waiting. Oh, my goodness. Can you you're, hear me? you're on. You're on the air. Okay. I'm still a bit gobsmacked because I've, I've listened to you guys for so long. Like, it's kind of weird back and talking to you over the phone. Um, okay. Um, I'm calling, um, I'm a little bit late topic wise, but I'm calling uh, in regards to something that Tracy was talking about a few times ago that she was on about um, being in a state of sleep paralysis and thinking that uh, she had a lawnmower. Um, yes. Uh, but not being able to actually say whether or not that was a lawnmower because uh, the, the sensors aren't always yeah. um, uh, trustworthy. Or a two stroke engine of some kind, I don't know. Sorry? But yeah, it was like just, I heard a two-stroke engine, I thought. Okay, dokie. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I, ho I hope it's an accurate enough uh, <laughs> summary. I, sure. I'm getting something coming through. I hope my, um, I hope my connection is all right. Um, but yeah, it was to do with people giving personal anecdotes about things they've heard, but, you know, sometimes when they've been asleep, sometimes not. But, um, you know, these personal experiences, you keep hearing from people about, you know, this is what I heard, it proof me or whatever. Um, and I was listening to this, and I was sort of wriggling in my chair a bit because I was so excited. I had a um, a story with a similar moral to it, um, if you will, except that it wasn't a lawnmower that I heard. It was actually someone breathing in my room. <laughs> yeah, spooky, and, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, look, I'm really sorry. I can't actually see you guys while I'm talking, so that might be a bit confusing. I'm sorry. Because um, my connection's not fantastic. But... Um, yeah, and I was actually completely awake. I was in bed, but I had gotten up and I had turned on the light. I was uh, looking around my room trying to get some information about where this is coming from. Um, I'd like gone outside into my balcony, the hallway, and downstairs, but I, I, I sort of just had to go back to bed, um, not being able to figure out what exactly this was, but, you know, having a skeptical conscience. And, or if it um, was anything. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, you, we, how do you rule out auditory hallucination when you're on your own, you know? Yeah, and I guess the question there, I would have is, when you left the bedroom, did you still hear it? No, I didn't hear it when I left my bedroom, and, but, I, but I did hear it when I went back in. It was, it was faint enough to not be heard if I had, like, the TV running or something, but it, in the absence of other noise, it was so um, distinguishable. Okay. Um, so I, I basically just had to lie there... And dissatisfied, just you know, knowing that whatever it was, I, I could not say that this is actually you know a ghost in my room or something. And there was no way that I was going to go to any of my housemates the next day and say that this is actually something that happened, despite that being exactly what I had heard. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes things just sound like other things. I remember an incident where I, at a place I used to work, where there was this creaky door sound in the women's room, even when you were the only one in there and there were no doors moving. And it was so bizarre. And I heard somebody talking a little bit later about it, and someone called it like the haunted bathroom. And I started laughing. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she said, you know that it, you can hear the creaky door. And I was like, yeah, that is so funny. What is that? And they were like, I don't know. Well, finally, someone figured it out. I figured it out at one point. But when I brought it to the other women, they were like, oh, yeah, we already figured it out, too. There was an air freshener in there that was like way up near the ceiling and every time that thing would go off it was I don't know if it was timed or how it was set but every time it went off it made the creaky door noise sounded just exactly. like a haunted house creaky door sound but it was an air freshener exactly <laughs> like, what, what got me about this was I mean it, it sounded so real and just knowing that if I had been a person that actually already believed in ghosts how easily that could be a, a confirmation yeah. for me Oh yeah. Yeah, and there's, it, it also depends on what you know. There's a bunch of things that if you if you aren't aware of them, you don't have the option to consider them as options. I, yeah. I on more than one occasion, I've thought I heard, you know, like a whistling, breathing, and I had to stop and say, okay, is that me? Let me see if I can oh, yeah. consciously time my breathing to what I heard to see if that was me, or let me break time. And sometimes it is, and sometimes it's some other noise. But there's also that one of my favorite bands, which I think is now defunct, is uh, Venus Hum, and they were named after. Uh, a, a condition where you have this constant swishing, throbbing noise, uh, essentially, uh, that you're hearing uh, because of the way the blood goes through your ear and stuff like that. And if you didn't know anything about it, it'd definitely sound weird. 
Exactly. Or if you came from a, a sexual society that was more superstitious or um, if someone had a, like cursed you and told you you were going to be haunted that night. Just <laughs> yeah, and but this is something, this is something you would hear. This is something you would hear and nobody else would be able to hear, and yet it's real, and you don't necessarily have an easy way to demonstrate it. So Exactly. And it's just, it just it gobsmacked me because of how many times <laughs> I dismissed it with this, this argument of, well, I heard it, and you can't tell me what I, what I heard. Like, it was me. I was there. And so on and so forth. But, like, I really hope someone might listen to this who might be thinking that, you know, I'm just so dogmatically skeptical that, um, you know, it could have been a ghost, but I wouldn't have believed it because I, I actually did find out what it was ah. um, eventually. And it was so banal. Um, it was, I got, it got a bit louder and I got up again and checked my balcony again. And swung my head around. It was a terrace house. I swung my head around. It turned out it was my next door neighbor snoring really loudly. And just the way it came through the wall yep. was just, to my brain, indistinguishable from having someone actually breathing in my room. There you go. Um, but if, even if, he, you know, if his wife just had given him a nod that he had a, you know, shut up or rolled over, I just would have been left in that state of not knowing <laughs> what it was, but not being able to actually justifiably say that, you know, just because... I heard someone breathing in my room, knew yeah. that there was someone breathing in my room. And this is why I really hate when people demand a debunking of something like that, because you can't go back and find out what it is. You can make some guesses, you can you know, give it your best shot, but you really can't always say this is what was going on. Sometimes that input is no longer there and there's no way to, to know what it was. Um, but ultimately, what I wish people would understand is that they're leaning on the argument from ignorance. So if somebody says to me, it's a ghost unless you can prove otherwise, unless you can debunk my ghost theory, it's like, it, it, you don't get to, it doesn't just become a ghost because you can't explain it. Exactly. And there's another <laughs> example say to you, well, I you know, they think they're being more, um, a more, yeah. more reasonable kind of thing. It's like, oh, I, I know it's not proof for you, but it's proof for me. It's like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking no, about. No, it's like, not it's proof at all. Yeah. How did you accept that as proof? Yeah, the fact I you know. can't explain something doesn't make it proof of anything. <laughs> Exactly. Anyway, thanks a lot for the call, Patrick. I appreciate it. No, thanks very much. Thank Take you. Care. Yeah, there's. Uh, so sometimes I have problems sleeping, and it, it gets to the point where I need it really quiet. And I remember going to bed one night, and I lay down and put my head on the pillow, and I hear, and I'm like, holy crap, one of the neighbors is jamming. Got their bass, yeah. I sit up, and it goes away. <laughs> like I can't hear it, and I lay back down and I hear it again, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, I know it's coming out. Maybe the, you know, the wall in the pillow is probably amplifying it a little bit. I so I leave the house. Air conditioning. Yeah, go ahead. I leave the house and I walk all over the neighborhood, and I cannot find where this music's coming from. But it was, it was clearly music and not a water. And so it turns out, uh, my, my the bedroom is directly over the garage, and it was coming from, I don't know. A neighbor's way down the street. You couldn't even hear it when you were out on the street. Huh. It had to follow this really strange path, and then my garage became an amplifier, which fed up to the That's wall where so my weird. pillow was, and that was the only way you were going to hear it. So, so I weird. couldn't even go to my neighbors and be like, turn it down, it's too loud, because it really wasn't. It's just, <laughs> I've got a garage amplifier. <laughs> it's the weird architecture. It was built that way on purpose by a, by a loony architect who... They planned it just to annoy yeah. me when it was time for sleep. Yeah, this is creepy. <laughs> it needs to be a film on Netflix. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, Lamont in Irvington, New Jersey. Thanks for waiting. Yes. Hi, Matt. This is G-Man. Yeah, I know uh, who it is. I knew who it was before you even said anything. <laughs> well, Matt, listen, I'm not mad at you for having your opinion about me, and maybe I should have been a little bit more professional with uh, how I uh, went about uh, confronting you about my differences with, with the slavery issue. Well, there's there's um, a bunch of things that, you, you know, we could, we could say. I found it interesting because somebody sent me a clip that you said you were going to call in this week, and the thing that struck me, and this is the point at which I stopped listening to you uh, in that particular clip, was that you said you were willing to call in to talk to Jeff or Matt or that woman. Um, first of all, Jeff's not on the show. He does nonprofits. But uh, which that woman were you, uh, you know, dismissing? with that kind of, oh, it's that woman. That young lady sitting next to you that I can't remember her name. I, know okay. her I think her one. last name is Peoples, I think. Cool. That Jen, that's okay. Jen, that's not me. Ah, yeah, that's Jen, that's not the person <laughs> sitting next to me. 
there, there, there are two uh, that women's. There are two that women's in the regular. Anyway, what do you need? Now, I just want to ask you a question. This is honestly the only reason I kept getting on your case. I would like to hear out of your own mouth why do you believe that is wrong for a human being to own another human being in of itself? Are you saying you don't believe it's wrong? I don't believe that there's anything wrong with a human being owning another human being in of itself. So that you think there's nothing in and of itself wrong with one human being owning another human being? Nope. I okay. care about the actions that follow, that follow um, the person owning the other person. So we, we, can I own you then? Yes, you can, just so as long as you uh, have me do good and not evil. Okay, so you're willing to be my property. Yes, I am, as long as you have me do good and not evil. Well, I, you, you know, I'm going to have you come and, first of all, pick all the weeds out of my yard. Is that fine? Uh, as long as I'm compensated afterward, no problem. Oh, well, what's compensated? Uh, That's not slavery. Money. I don't have to pay my property. Money. I don't have to pay property. That's not slavery. Yeah, you would be kind of like a chair to him. I mean, I'd, I'd give you enough food to keep you alive, but, you know, you know and, and I'd give you like a doghouse in the backyard. So what and, you're saying is because you own me and you tell me you do something and you don't pay me, that's not slavery? No, that is that slavery. Is slavery. <laughs> that's what we're saying. You, I, you, if you're property, um, you're, that's slavery. One person owning another person is slavery. Yeah, right. And we're all slaves to something. No, 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 no. You don't get to go to metaphoric slavery. Nobody owns me as property. I've heard you say that NBA players, despite their ridiculous salaries, are slaves to the, to the team owners. And that's, that's just false. I mean, that's like stupidly false. Well, there's a book out called um, High Price Slaves, and uh, the author of that book disagrees with you. Yeah, the but, author of that book is probably speaking yeah. in metaphor, but what I'm talking about is slavery like slavery that's sanctioned in yeah. the Bible. Like the state saying okay. your property. Okay, so let's talk about that then. You obviously have a problem with indentured servitude. Uh, no, 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 no. No, I, oh, okay. I, I, I do have a problem with indentured servitude, but I'm talking about slavery in the Bible. Would you be willing to be my slave according to what the Bible says? Oh, yes, of course. Just so, 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 I can, so if you're my slave, I can beat you then, right? Uh, yes, you can if, if I break a mosaic law. If you no, 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 no. It doesn't say that. It just says, yes, I, can it beat, yes, it it says I can beat you as long as you don't die within a day or two. It does say that, but according to the Mosaic Law, you can't just smite them. In the very same chapter of that book, uh, it talks about how you can't smite your servant until they die. No, 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 no. No, 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 it doesn't. See, here's the thing. You don't understand your own Bible, and that's why it's so funny that you keep telling to read your Bible and do what it says. Because the verses that you cite earlier in Exodus 21 are talking about laws against other people, other Hebrews, other people who are not slaves. There's separate laws for the people who are slaves. It's very clear. You, it's like you, you stop reading at the very verse that explains this to you. So it says, if I, beat, if I, if I strike a man and kill him, I'm to be punished. Well, but we don't have enough time on your show for me to actually to show me the verses for this. But I actually I do. Stuff. I have a Bible right well, here. We've do, got do, a Bible. Do you do you do you not okay, have so, a Bible? So, do you not have a Bible handy? We can look at the verses. Hang on. Do you not have a Bible handy? Uh, I don't have one in front of me, but okay. I can say this. So if you why on finish, earth why on earth don't you have a Bible with you? Matt, you know one of the things that you got on my case about is being is you not being professional. And right now you're not acting professional. Right now, I, you should I, let me finish. No, hang on. I don't have to let you finish to be professional because. So I did a 35-minute video in response to your position. Have you watched it? Uh, yes, I did, and I responded to most of it. No, actually, I, well, okay. Uh, since I stopped watching your channel, what I saw as a response uh, wasn't a response to most of it, because I read the Bible and I explained it. So, like okay. Exodus, and you were wrong in every point that you made. You gave I was presuppositions. You didn't give accurate biblical um, interpretations for what you were reading. You was explaining it according to how you understood it, and no one was there to challenge you on what you were saying. So, of course, you're going to these are laws. These are codified laws. This They're not just, interpretive. This isn't just <laughs> my, you know, my understanding of it. For example, in 1861, there's a rabbi, Rabbi Raphael, who justified human slavery from the Bible by saying, and I quote. Under the same protection as any other species of lawful property, that the Ten Commandments are the Word of God, and as such, of the very highest authority, is acknowledged by Christians as well as Jews. How dare you, he's saying to the people who are opposed to slavery, how dare you, in the face of the sanction and protection afforded to slave property in the Ten Commandments, how dare you denounce slaveholding as a sin, when you remember that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, the men with whom the Almighty conversed, with whose names are emphatically connects his own most holy name and character of perfect upright, featuring God and eschewing evil, that all these men were slaveholders, does it not strike you that you are guilty of something very little short of blasphemy? 
Well, I'm not really sure what kind of flavor he's talking about. He's talking about the Transylvania slave trade. No, 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 no. no, no. He said I don't the know what he's talking about. I'm just going by a quote that you're saying right now. So, so, the, so the transatlantic slave trade uh, is not relevant to this discussion, except that for some reason you object to that. When no, the you don't, the Atlantic slave trade is an abomination. Okay, and I don't support it, and I don't want nothing to do with that. However, sure. So, so, so when the Bible, being another human being in of itself. Gary, Gary. So when the Bible tells you to go to war with people, and that when you're done, the people that you've gone to war with become your slaves, and that you can own them, they are your property, which you can pass on to your children, and that you can beat them as long as they don't die within a day or two. <laughs> Um, you, you're fine with all that, but you object to the transatlantic slave tr trade. Well, again, if you actually study the scriptures and look at what God condones and what he doesn't condone, you find out that the Hebrews are always subjective to the Mosaic law. Hebrews they are, you moron! The they love them Gary! Too. Gary, Hebrews are! Other people aren't. Did you not see where I read the verse that says you'll buy your slaves from the heathen who surround you? That there are different yeah, I'm rules. Sure of that one, Hang but on. I'm also aware you're not the, reading everything either. There, you're cherry picking right now. No, I'm not cherry picking. Yes, you I, are. I, in the course of that video, I read pretty much every verse that the Bible has about slavery in context. There are different rules for Hebrew slaves than there are for non Hebrew slaves. Do you understand that? Yeah, I would like to publicly apologize for you because you didn't even nearly touch all the passages of scripture in that video touching slavery. So you're making a mistake right now. No, uh, you didn't do that. Okay, so, so thanks for that bald assertion from the person who doesn't have the Bible in front of them. I asked a question. Uh, I, I, Are you I, aware? I'm quite aware of this topic, and I know you didn't even... You're not, a, you're not aware of this. Okay, so let me ask, do you, are you aware that there's a difference between Hebrew servants and slaves? Yes, I do, but they're both, they're both in the technical sense, are slaves, though. Are you aware that the rules the Bible outlines are different for the treatment of Hebrew servants than they are for non-Hebrew slaves? There are some rules that are different from the Hebrews right, than the from yes. the servitude. Yes, like the rules in Exodus 21, where it talks about, uh, let me get to the verse, if a man beats his male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies as a direct result, he must be punished, but he is not to be punished if the slave gets up after a day or two since the slave is his property. Okay, I'm aware of that, but you're you're ignoring the other stuff too about like for example, if the slave were to run away, that you can't um, go get him back. I'm not ignoring that. I, I'm not. Why is that relevant? Work on the Sabbath, you're I, not talking about that stuff. You're, you're cherry picking on all the negative stuff that you perceive. To okay. Be no, no, no. Calling out the negative stuff is not the same as cherry picking. See, I'm pointing out the things that I found objectionable. Yes, it talks about giving them the Sabbath off. So what? If they are your property that you can pass on to your kids, and this verse just said that you can beat them as long as they don't get up, as long as they get up within a day or two, and you're saying that's a good thing? I'm telling you that your that not yours, but a lot of people's pre presuppositions regarding. Uh, I asked a question. My presuppositions, please. my presuppositions are irrelevant. I asked a question. Well, they are. Yes. Okay. I I asked a question. This book right here, where I just read to you says right. that the slave owner can beat their slaves as long as they don't die within two or three days. Is that a mm -hmm. good thing or an, or an evil thing? Well, if I'm looking at it from your perspective... It's I, don't, I want I'm your perspective. perspective. I'm, I'm asking you for your perspective, for crying out loud. I didn't answer your question. From my perspective, no, because I fully understand what I'm reading. Okay. I know that the Hebrews were permitted... From beating them for no apparent reason. The only way you can beat your slave to begin with where's is that? they break one of the Mosaic laws. Yeah, where's that? Well, no, wait, what'd you say? They have to break one of the Mosaic laws. And where does it where does it food. say you where does it say you can only beat your slaves if they break one of the Mosaic laws? You know, if you back up a few verses, it says that you can't submit your servant until uh, sure. the point that he's I'll died, back up a few also, verses. Um, I'll back up a few verses. To where? Uh, I believe it's in verse twelve of the same um of the same uh, uh, chapter that you're reading. Isn't that in Exodus yeah, 21? Yeah, uh, verse 12. Anyone who strikes a man and kills him shall surely be put to death. Right. Okay, that is, first of all, that is a law about a man, which is a different category from slaves. So you can't argue uh, from the general to the specific. The of God. Well, if it says in verse 12, if you strike a man and kill him, you should be put to death. And it says in verse 21 that if you strike a, man, a slave and kill him, you should be punished. I don't know that there's a problem there. You haven't, this verse 12 doesn't in any way say, listen, listen, listen. no, hang on, I'm not, I'm in the mid-sentence. This verse 12 doesn't in any way say what you said it says. I said, where's the verse that says you can only beat slaves if they break Mosaic law? 
Okay, I know that in sec- from, from a secular standpoint, when you're looking at that verse, it looks like this man can just do whatever he wants with his slave. He but can. They're his property. That's what it says. Rules for him too, and he's certain things he can and can't do. Really? He has to obey the, the 613 Mosaic laws. And there are a lot more than the couple that you're bringing up right now. Uh, I know about the 613 laws. Uh, so you do? Where, yes. Where, where does it okay, say so that... What about, so how do you reconcile that with um, let your neighbor leave up yourself? To be different from the Egyptians... They're not your they neighbors. Slaves, when they were slaves in the land of Egypt. These are not your neighbors. When the Bible talks about neighbors and brethren, they are talking either about fellow Hebrews or fellow Christians, depending on the thing. It's not everybody. Really? So, 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 so if the Bible's all about love the your neighbor... The, the good Samaritan. How, how, do you, how do you reconcile that with the parable of the good Samaritan? The Samaritan was somebody that the Jews hated to death. However... How does the Good however, Samaritan story Jesus in any way... Gary how, how, Gary, Gary, how does the Good Samaritan story in any way refute this passage? Because you just said that my neighbor is a fellow Hebrew and that's a lot in the pit of hell. So, so <laughs> when we're talking about biblical laws, there are different categories. There, for example, you're not allowed to charge your fellow Jew interest, but you can charge it to non-Jews. You're aware of that, right? No, I'm, I'm, I'm fully aware that there are different laws for, for, for indentures. Sure. And span of so, so let me make this let me make this really easy then. Even if even if we accepted that you can only beat your slaves if they break one of the Mosaic laws, why is that good? Why should it ever be good to beat another person? Well, let's consider adultery, for example. Yes, if let's. let's. Adultery, I'm trying to answer your question. Let's take adultery for example, right? Adultery in, in the Old Testament, you got the death penalty for that. Yeah, if why is that a good thing? If you to the point that you're going to die, then that's a little bit better than actually being killed. Oh, that's how okay. Is better. So first of all, why is it a good thing that if you commit adultery, you, you're put to death? And then why is it a good thing that you're beaten? Uh, it's called punishment. When you do wrong, when you break a national law, that there are going to be punishments, just like in our society. Try going out there breaking one of those laws. We don't do that in our society. We don't, we don't beat people in our society. Yeah, and we oh, don't put them to death for consensual sex. They do illegally in jail when you're a prisoner and a slave in these jail systems. I'm sorry? Uh, in these jail systems that we have today, you take people like me and they beat us to death and they have us raped in their prisons on a regular basis. Don't give me this stuff to put my Yeah, but that's not condi- that is, is a it, sanctioned by the state. It's not a, it's not a law. Okay, we're talking about, this book advocates laws, and you're saying that they're a good thing. That it's a good thing to beat somebody who right. committed adultery, or that it's a good it's, thing it's to beat good somebody. That somebody's punished when they break a law. We have to have law and order. Okay. If someone breaks a law, we have to, we have to um, punish the people who are breaking laws. It's pretty simple. So yeah. you support lashing and death penalty for adultery? Yeah, the death penalty for adultery. What, wow, what okay. Jenna, I, I just want to thank you because you're like a billboard for atheism. No, I'm not. No, I'm yeah, not. you no, are. No. If this is if this is the kind of morality that religion promotes, then I I I feel no compunction about saying that it's bereft of morality. Okay, so why don't Matt Dillon Hunty debate me on this when we can spend more time talking about this in detail? Then I, I I'm seeing his point more and more why he won't debate you. I mean, this is you speak for yourself very well. I don't think you need refutation. You you are. I don't, uh, insane. I don't need reputation. Me and him obviously have a disagreement. I think it would do the world a lot of good if he changed my mind if I'm wrong. I apologize for that last right, label, by the so way. Why, why would it do the world a lot of good if I changed your mind? First of all, I have well, no... I hang on, let me finish. Saying. Let me finish. First of all, I have no reason to think you're going to change your mind because you keep demonstrating that you couldn't recognize a rational argument if it walked up wearing a t-shirt saying rational argument and smacked you about the head with a rational argument fish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why don't you accept the debate then? If you're so confident, why don't you accept the debate then? Why would I want... For the same reason I don't play basketball against kindergartners. The Bible thumping wingnut, you was on his show, I have more subscribers, I have more views than he does. And you went on do you, do you know why? Netflix, do, do you know why? Do you against you. Do you, you face me on the slavery issue, you're going into retirement. Uh, period. I just, I just faced you on the slavery issue. No, you didn't. Over you the course of this program. You I, short man scripture hard, everybody knows it. I, I just faced you on the slavery issue on this very show, and I'm not in retirement because I'm telling no, you what you the didn't scripture face says. You on this topic. What you did was you straw manned the Bible. You won't even take responsibility. Straw manned the Bible. Some of the scriptures that you misquoted, you tried to change the subject. It's what did I misquote? Months. What did I misquote? And you better be very specific, okay, or your okay, ass is right. done okay, forever. The neighbor issue. The neighbor issue. You said, and I quote, that that, that that my neighbor is only a Hebrew, a fellow Hebrew. When I tell you, look at the parable. Of the Actually, that's Lord, not what I you, said. I, I said the parable of the Good Samaritan. I said okay? that's not you what I said. Samaritans were the neighbors. I, it's not what I said, and people will be able to rewind to hear the difference between your and I quote oh, and I what I actually said. To, I assure you of that. Yeah, they will. Yeah, and, and what happens when I'm right, Matt? Are you going to agree to a, um, 
debate then when you have to admit that you're wrong about that? No, because I said that when it refers to that, it's either referring to your fellow Hebrews or fellow Christians, and you didn't quote that part. Matt, despite what you think, Matt, I do have some respect for you. Thank you for letting me on. I appreciate that. Are you leaving? Time. Are you running no, away? No, 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 I'm not. I'm not leaving. If you want to, you want me to continue to talk, I'll talk. I, I, well, I, I'd really like you to get to see. You You say that you're, you're okay with owning other people's property. You're okay with beating them, although only that's if... That's not what I said. I, I, I said that I don't believe that there's anything wrong with a human being owning another human being in of itself. If the person isn't telling you to do anything, you can't say it's wrong for a human being to own another human being. And you haven't given one good, solid, rational reason on how that could be wrong. Oh, see, see, here's the thing. Um, we, we, I asked you about owning another person as property. Okay? And okay. you're saying it matters what you have them do. Right. But, the, but if they're property, they're property. Okay? Okay. So okay. just like, you know, my hammer... Or yeah, they're not my, a human being it, anymore. So what, what you yeah. have them do, like if I, if I coach a friend to go out and slaughter a bunch of people, that's a bad thing. Um, but I'm talking about actually owning another human being so that they are not free to leave. Okay? All right, so, so that they are not able to exercise their freedom to live their life. That is the objection to owning someone as property. Hmm. But that means you seem to have a problem with the prison system then. No. The because prison, the the prison system, they can't go nowhere. They don't got the freedom to do whatever they want no more. And their freedoms are limited. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, th this, is, this is a very common fallacy where I've talked about the foundation for why it is wrong to do something. That doesn't mean that there aren't exceptions that are similar that would permit it. I'm talking about slavery. I own this person. I have purchased them from someone else. They are now my property. They cannot go free. This is nothing at all like the, like the prison system, which is you had a social contract with society and you violated it. And for the protection of society and perhaps the protection of others and maybe yourself, we are putting you away. That's right. And when you're put away, you're considered a prisoner or a slave. You, you are not you considered a slave. You, yeah, you are a ward of the state. Yeah. The state has a responsibility to be a <laughs> steward <laughs> of your health. And you know what? I agree with you, because when you look at indentured servitude, as, since uh, the Old Testament, uh, they, they, uh, God set up a system of restitution, if somebody owed a debt, they were thrown into slavery for seven years until that debt was paid. Six, six, six years. That's immoral. Six, six years. They were let go in the seven years. Six year. years. And they, and yes, okay, yeah. great. Was and you Hebrew thought that was Saturday? immoral, but you're arguing for it now. Um, no. I, so first of all, I do have problems with indentured servitude, because there isn't necessarily a system of checks in there. Um, you know, when you're talking about the ancient world, I don't know how you go about demonstrating that you've done your six years. And also, it's an oversimplified system where it's, if I want to plot a land, it's six years. If I want two plots of land, is that also six years? Is everything six years? So there's some absurdities there, but you, you keep dodging this issue of owning someone as property so that they are, they are your property. They cannot exercise their freedoms, their desires. They are yours. And you think that, I, well, I'll ask you again. Do you have a problem with owning someone as property such that they're not free to go about their life as they want? Uh, no, I don't have a problem with that, and I'll tell you why. I don't care why. You're gone. <laughs> and this is why I see no point in engaging with G-Man. Um, this is, this is a, what you see when a religion has so poisoned a mind that they can't even read what is plainly there. They have to go find some way to make it good. Ah, it says you can beat your slaves as long as they don't die within two or three days. But I'll go find this other verse here that says if you beat a man and kill him, um, you're to be put to death. By the way, that verse says man. There's completely separate rules for female slaves as well. So not only is there a different set of rules for Hebrew slaves and non-Hebrew slaves, but there's also a different set of rules for females. Uh, and they don't follow that. They don't follow the released after six years. Uh, the passages, there's Leviticus 22, there's Deuteronomy, there's uh, Exodus, and I put them all in this video. It's like 35 minutes long where I'm going through the Bible and reading it and explaining it. And when a mind gets so poisoned by religion, the foundational presupposition that he has is that what God says is necessarily good. What the Bible has to say is necessarily good. And that forces you to start twisting things around until you can find a way to make it good. And when you can't do that and you're backed into a corner, it forces you to say something like, yes, I, have, I, I don't have any objection to someone owning someone else as property at, so that they are unable to exercise their freedom and go about their life. And this is coming. Uh, which I think is kind of extra sad 
from an African-American male. Why on earth would I ever debate somebody like that? It'd be, it'd be like saying, um, I think that it's wrong to molest children. And somebody comes up and says, I think you're wrong about that. I'd like to have a debate. I'm fine with having conversations and discussions. I'm fine with talking about why we disagree. But in no way am I going to set up a debate in front of real live people or even in a hangout to debate someone who wants to argue that it's okay to molest children or that it's okay to own people. These, they have become so morally bankrupt that they have divorced themselves from the realm of debate and discourse. I didn't exclude G-Man. He has excluded himself because he loves his religious idea more than humanity. And I don't have any time for that. Next. <laughs> Next. Hey, here's a good one. Uh, Thaddeus in Springfield, Missouri. Thanks for waiting. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, we uh, only got a couple minutes left, thanks to Gary. Yeah, but. <laughs> yeah uh, I'd just like to pose uh, one particular question. Now, this question was uh, actually tied into the previous caller. I found that somewhat interesting. Um, aside from people like the gentleman that just called, who I think needs to seek mental help, um, <laughs> Why the Old Testament? It's it's very it's a consensus amongst most Christians that it's depraved and that we don't need to or we shouldn't per se um, abide by those kind of laws in today's society. And the, the the reason they say that we no longer have to do this is because yeah. Jesus died on the cross. Yeah. My question is why was that ever like okay to begin with? I've it's asked the you. same God. Yeah, yeah, it's, I've yeah, asked yeah, there's a number of different apologetics. One is, oh, that Old Testament stuff doesn't matter anymore because Jesus came and fixed everything and changed everything. And then there's another apologetic which kind of goes along the lines that G-Man says, and William Lane Craig, by the way, would partially agree with G-Man because he's made all kinds of excuses for the atrocities committed in the Old Testament. And for the people, though, that say it's changed, but what they're saying is that this used to be moral according to God and now it's not. And why would that change? Yeah. But see, that's my question right there. Why does it have to change? If, if God the will is perfect, if his plan is perfect, yeah. why did he have to know it out? And why did he have to use a blood sacrifice to do it? Yep. It's, it's all bizarre. But we are completely out of time. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, special thanks to Gary for calling and uh, demonstrating why I don't need to waste any more time. There's the folks who made the, make the show happen, and uh, some of us will get together for dinner afterwards at El Arroyo. Bye-bye. Two weeks. We'll be back in two weeks.